what I thought I would do this evening is just kind of give an overview of what is a Chiari malformation. Oh, good, our audience is bigger. <laughs> uh, what is it? Who can be who can be helped with surgical treatment uh, of a Chiari malformation and associated conditions such as syringomyelia primarily? Uh, and then a little bit about what's actually done in surgery, what we hope to accomplish with the surgical decompression of a Chiari 1 malformation. Uh, and then for those who have had surgery, how do we follow them after surgery? For those who we determine wouldn't benefit from an operation, uh, how we monitor them uh, over time. And because we're at the Children's Hospital and I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon, this is really focused mainly on pediatric patients. Uh, if there are questions that pertain more to adult patients, I'll try to field them as best I can. Uh, I have taken care of adults in the past, in both in my training and then in the earlier part of my career in some different practice settings. I did do some adult work, uh, including some adult Chiari surgery. Uh, but certainly since coming here, uh, we're kind of a big busy children's hospital and, and we're part of a neurosurgery department at, at UAB that has very excellent coverage uh, on the adult side. So it's pretty rare that they ask us to, to come and, and help them with anything up there and, and vice versa for that matter. Uh, so with that uh, introduction, there we go. All right, so this is, this is the, my overview of what it is that I wanna cover. Uh, What's a Chiari malformation? There it goes. Uh, what sort of problems does it cause frequently? Uh, can it cause somewhat less frequently? What's the intent of surgery with regard to correcting the underlying problem that's producing uh, the symptoms and signs and so forth? Uh, what kind of patients we think would benefit from surgery and then follow up? All the things that I just mentioned, that, uh, that's pretty much that. All right, so what is a Chiari malformation? Uh, at, at, at the most basic level, a Chiari malformation is herniation or descent of brain tissue, uh, predominantly cerebellum, but there can be some brainstem involvement as well, below the foramen magnum. The foramen magnum is the opening at the base of the skull, where the skull sits on top of the spine at the top of the neck. And normally the foramen magnum just has the junction between the bottom of the brainstem and the spinal cord there, and then there's a space for spinal fluid all around it. In a Chiari malformation, there's something extra that's hanging out of the base of the skull into the top of the spinal canal in the neck, and that something extra it varies depending upon the type of the Chiari malformation. And the focus of what I want to talk about this evening is the type one Chiari malformation is which is by far and away the most common type. And so in a Chiari 1 malformation, the brain tissue that is herniating through the foramen magnum at the base of the skull uh, is a portion of the cerebellum called the tonsils. It's kind of the lower tip of the two halves of the cerebellum, uh, immediately posterior to or behind um, the junction between the bottom of the brain stem or the medulla uh, and the spinal cord. And by radiographic definition, there needs to be more than five millimeters of descent or herniation of that brain tissue below the base of the skull. So, so more than five millimeters into the spinal canal at the top of the neck. Uh, other types of Chiari malformations are somewhat less common or vanishingly rare. Uh, the other type that we in pediatric neurosurgery deal with on a fairly regular basis is a type two Chiari malformation. And this is a, a malformation that's associated with spina bifida, babies that are born with an open defect, most commonly on the low back. Uh, and in a type two Chiari malformation, it's not the tonsils of the cerebellum, but it's the vermis, a different portion of the cerebellum, which is in the midline that descends below the foramen magnum. And in addition to the cerebellum being low, the, uh, at least a portion of the medulla, sometimes most or all of the medulla is actually below the base of the skull and in the spinal canal at the top of the neck. Uh, and that's not what I'm here to talk about this evening because that's really a whole different uh, ball game, so to speak. Uh, just for sake of completeness, uh, Professor Chiari described type three and type four Chiari malformations. Uh, a type three uh, is a 
almost vanishingly rare defect, which you can kind of think of as spina bifida at the top of the neck, base of the skull. So there's, there's a defect uh, of bone and skin and a, typically a, a very thin sac covering herniated cerebellum and brainstem that's not going down into the neck, but is actually protruding out the back. Uh, you might guess that these children don't live very long. Uh, and a type four that was described by Professor Chiari uh, is either an underdeveloped or an absent cerebellum. And that's not really anything that requires surgical treatment because if, if it didn't form, we're not gonna be able to create anything there uh, surgically. So that's all I'm gonna say about that. Uh, more recently, some other types of Chiari malformations have been described, and, and I'll just mention those briefly as well, and we may come back to those later on in the discussion or if people have questions about this. Um, our, our, our predecessor here, Dr. Oakes, uh, described a type zero Chiari malformation, uh, and his description of that is a very narrow, tightly defined population. They were adolescents primarily, uh, who had little or no descent of the cerebellar tonsils, and they all had an associated syrinx. And they all had a syrinx that was big enough that it was causing some problems, either scoliosis, weakness, sensory loss, whatever. Uh, and I'll go into that kind of stuff in a little bit more detail later. Uh, and in addition to having a syrinx, uh, even though they'd had little or no descent of the tonsils below the foramen magnum, the, the configuration of tissue at the foramen magnum was such that there was little or no room for spinal fluid to circulate freely, which seemed to be why they developed the syrinx. And so those patients, even though they, by radiographic criteria, did not have a Chiari-1 malformation, they had the response that you would expect in that if you did a Chiari decompression, then their syrinx would collapse much like someone with a Chiari-1 malformation. And so, so that's where the term Chiari-0 comes from. Uh, now, there are other surgeons at other centers who have sort of taken liberties with this and done Chiari decompression surgeries on patients who didn't have a syrinx and didn't have the radiographic criteria of Chiari-1, uh, sort of using Dr. Oak's description as, as justification, thinking that they might alleviate this or that other symptom. Uh, that's not what we do here. And then another term that's in the literature, also um, originally coined by Dr. Oaks, uh, is a Chiari one and a half malformation. And that's described as a type one Chiari malformation where there's descent of the tonsils. But in addition, the the junction between the medulla and the spinal cord is also below the foramen magnum. And, and those you can kind of think of as type one Chiari malformations that are more challenging surgically. And those patients tend to more often have symptoms referable to compression of the brainstem, probably because their brainstem is below the base of the skull where it doesn't belong. Uh, so how do we diagnose Chiari malformation? The, the diagnostic test to say whether or not someone has Chiari, at least by radiographic criteria, is an MRI scan. Uh, sometimes we'll get CT scans and, and the foramen magnum may look crowded on a CT and the radiologist will either say question Chiari or looks like there's a Chiari, but then we still get an MRI, not only to confirm the diagnosis, but also to get a better understanding of the relationship between the brainstem, spinal cord, uh, and, and the cerebellar tissue uh, that's herniating below the frame and magnum. We measure Chiari malformations by how far the tonsils are below the foramen and magnum. And so I've, I've given two examples here. The one on the left is a patient who does not have a Chiari malformation. This, this is a normal MRI that I just grabbed off of the, the, uh, the PACS system and I took the patient identification information off of it, of course. And I don't even know why this patient got a scan. I didn't look at the report or anything else. But we, we draw this line across the tip of the clivus and across the back of the foramen magnum at, at the bottom of the occipital bone and then see whether or not there's any cerebellar tissue that protrudes below that line. Uh, all the, the MRI scans that I'm gonna show you 
uh, in this talk are patients that I've taken care of. Most of them are surgical. Uh, I think there's one, yeah, there's one who was in Chiari Clinic last week uh, who did not need surgery, and so I'll, I'll point that one out a little bit later just as an example of uh, one that we're following uh, and not recommending surgery for. So the one on the right, the same line is drawn across the base of the skull, approximating the foramen magnum, and then you measure this perpendicular line from that line down to the tip of the cerebellar tonsils. So those of you further back probably can't read this, but it's 17 millimeters. So that's fairly significant and impressive looking on MRI. And the other thing I want to draw your attention to uh, in terms of how we think the Chiari causes symptoms and problems is, so the gray here, this is the brain stem, this is the spinal cord, this is the cerebellum back here. So that's all brain tissue and then spinal cord tissue. The black here and here, that's the space where the spinal fluid can circulate back and forth between the subarachnoid space in the head and the subarachnoid space that runs up and down the inside of the spinal canal inside of the sac that contains everything. So if you look here, the, the gray representing the brain stem, the spinal cord, and the cerebellum is pretty much filling this whole space, which is the foramen magnum. So you can see there's, there's some black up here, some of that spinal fluid space, some of that's actually the basilar artery. Uh, and then if you look below the foramen magnum, down here at the level of the second cervical vertebrae, you see some, some dark gray, almost black here, and same here. And so that's space for spinal fluid in front of and behind the spinal cord below the Chiari malformation. But right in here, there's really no space for spinal fluid. And, and the analogy that I learned from Dr. Oakes and, and use all the time in clinic uh, is you can, can think of this as kind of like a cork filling the neck of a wine bottle and, and doesn't allow any fluid to move in or out. Is all that clear as mud? <laughs> all right, so how does this translate to or cause uh, various symptoms and problems and neurologic deficits for patients. So there are three sort of general mechanisms by which Chiari malformations cause trouble. Uh, first is impairment of that spinal fluid flow back and forth between the cranial compartment and the spinal canal because of this cork in the wine bottle phenomenon. That typically manifests as pain in the back of the head or the top of the neck and often brought on by something that causes a pressure fluctuation between the spinal canal and the, the intracranial space. Uh, something that is what in medical terms we call a Valsalva maneuver. That can be a cough, it can be a sneeze. Uh, I've had children who will have this pain come on uh, from jumping on a trampoline or some other sort of uh, exertion, whether it's play or athletics or whatever. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, I, I have in, in other practice settings taking care of adults. There was one young mother who I remember very clearly who said she would get this sharp pain in the back of the head whenever she yelled at her children when they were misbehaving, which <laughs> made parenting really challenging. Uh, and it's classically a, a pain that is sudden in onset of short duration, seconds to a minute or two at most. Uh, the other way, and this was uh, an ex one of the examples that uh, was given in the video that you watched just a little bit ago, uh, is some people will develop hydrocephalus because of obstruction of spinal fluid circulation at the foramen magnum or obstruction of spinal fluid being able to get out of the fourth ventricle and into that subarachnoid space where it then circulates up to eventually get reabsorbed in the bloodstream. So, so that's one major category is impairment of spinal fluid circulation. The second major category is direct compression of neural structures. Typically, the brainstem itself at the level of the medulla or the cranial nerves that exit in the lower brainstem uh, and go on to, to their various targets. Uh, the most common, at least in, in pediatric neurosurgery, the most common manifestation of that is children who have some sort of breathing or swallowing trouble. Uh, that can be a, a particular form of sleep apnea that's not because of enlarged tonsils and adenoids in the back of their throat, but it's because their brainstem is not regulating breathing like it should. Uh, it can be swallowing disorders such that uh, they, they have repeated episodes of aspiration, meaning saliva or food or liquid that they're swallowing or whatever goes into the, 
lung pathways as opposed to going down the esophagus like it's supposed to. Recurrent episodes of aspiration pneumonia can be seen with that. Um, and then the, the third big category is syringomyelia, which kind of relates back to impairment of CSF circulation, although exactly how that happens in terms of the pathophysiology, people like to argue about. Um, but, but somehow the, the impairment of spinal fluid circulation at the level of foramen magnum creates a situation where in some patients, uh, up to a third of the patients that we have operated on here over the years, again, primarily Dr. Oak's experience, uh, will develop an abnormal fluid cavity within the spinal cord called a syrinx. And there's an example of that in a little bit. Uh, so direct neural compression, as I said, that can cause swallowing problems and aspiration pneumonia. It can cause the, the typical symptom associated with sleep apnea is snoring and then long pauses between breaths. Uh, compression of the lower brain stem and cerebellar uh, tissue can cause clumsiness or, or ataxia. Uh, voice changes, hiccups can be a problem. Uh, some children will have disturbances of their eye movements uh, from compression of the lower brain stem. Uh, less commonly, facial pain or sensory loss uh, in the face or the, the mouth and tongue. Uh, and then reflex abnormalities can be seen from long-standing compression. So this is an example of a patient who not only has the Chiari malformation, you see the, the cerebellar tonsillar tissue below the foramen magnum here, but the configuration of the base of their skull in front of the brainstem and spinal cord, as well as the configuration of their second cervical vertebrae is such that it's causing compression from the front on the, the front of the medulla and the upper cord. Uh, so that's, that's kind of an extreme example, uh, and this is somebody who would require more than just the standard Chiari decompression that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. All right, on to syringomyelia. Uh, so here's an example of a patient with a Chiari malformation. They don't have major compression from the front like the one on the previous slide, uh, but you see all this dark lumpy, bumpy, almost like a string of sausages within their spinal cord. That's all an abnormal accumulation of fluid within the spinal cord, and that by definition is what a syrinx is. So having a syrinx in the spinal cord, or the, the condition is called syringomyelia, uh, can give you all sorts of problems, or some patients, even like this was a teenage girl, uh, that presented several years ago who really had very mild symptoms and almost no deficit in terms of motor function, sensation, et cetera. I mean, if, if you saw her walking down the street or, or you know, walking through the mall, you wouldn't think there was anything wrong with her. But she's got the syrinx that ate Sheboygan <laughs> in her spinal cord. Uh, and this, you know, this, this is something that's seriously threatening her ability to continue walking around and going to school and she was a cheerleader cheering and you know all, all these sorts of things. This is a serious problem. Uh, so significant syringomyelia like this can be associated or cause uh, scoliosis, particularly if it's a single curve to the left side, which is the opposite of the, the more common form of scoliosis that, that happens in adolescence. Uh, called idiopathic scoliosis because we don't have really understand why some kids get that. Uh, can cause weakness and even loss of muscle mass in the arms, can cause increased tone or spasticity, stiffness in the legs, uh, can cause weakness on one side of the body. Uh, one of the classic presentations of that's described with syringomyelia uh, is loss of pain and temperature sensation in a cape-like distribution, so the shoulders and the upper arms. Uh, one thing that, uh, that the orthopedic surgeons in particular often or, or routinely look for uh, in their scoliosis referrals is whether or not they have the abdominal reflex that you, you get from stroking the skin on the, on the belly. Uh, and then in really advanced cases that have been long standing, uh, you can, patients can develop what are called charco joints because they've lost sensation in a joint. It could be the shoulder, it could be the knee, it could be the hip, and there's 
damage that accumulates over time because they don't have sensation there, the joint wears out, gets really swollen, uh, and, and lose function because of that in addition to potentially losing function because of the effect of the, the, the pressure of this fluid cavity on the motor and sensory pathways within the spinal cord. All right, so the title of the talk was Chiari Surgery, Who Needs It? So patients who have any of these kind of problems that I just described that, that fit into these, these categories um, are patients that we can pretty reliably help with surgical intervention. And the surgical intervention that we do is directed at correcting the underlying problem of compression of neural elements, impaired CSF circulation, and then the, the, the decompression as regards to the syringomyelia is also trying to correct the impaired CSF circulation so that over time the, the driving force that created the syrinx is taken away and then the syrinx can gradually collapse and correct itself. Uh, so again, the kind of, of pain symptoms that we think are most closely associated with the Chiari malformation is this Chiari type headache brought on by a Valsalva maneuver, cough, sneeze, etc. So patients who have, happen to have a Chiari malformation but have headaches that are in a, a migraine type pattern or a tension headache type pattern or have chronic daily headache, they're not likely to benefit from a surgical intervention because their, you know, their headache is one of the most common reasons that people go to see doctors, you know, uh, people of any age and, and uh, any doctors and, and so forth. And most of them are not Chiari type headaches. Uh, by the same token, patients who have neck pain that's of musculoskeletal origin or related to degenerative spine disease in the neck, uh, Chiari surgery is not going to help them. Uh, because the problem is in the posterior fossa, the lower brain stem, uh, so if, if there's a, a way that we can provide or, or understand an anatomic explanation of their symptoms that relates to lower brainstem or cranial nerve dysfunction, then they're probably going to benefit from surgical decompression. Uh, problems that come from higher up in the brain, from the cerebrum or the cortex, things like epilepsy, autism, developmental delay problems, uh, they're not likely to benefit from Chiari decompression surgery. Syringomyelia it is, if it's significant, like the one I showed a moment ago, uh, then Chiari surgery is probably going to help that. Because MRI scans are obtained pretty frequently and, and are very widely available now, uh, we have seen over the past, I'd say at least five years, uh, a lot more referrals for patients who have been given a diagnosis of syringomyelia based on an MRI scan, but what we're actually seeing is a, a normal structure that's a little more obvious in some people than it is in others. Just like there are fluid chambers in the brain, there's a central canal in the spinal cord that everyone has. In most of us, it's so small that you can't even see it on the MRI scan. But in some people, it, it may be a little bit bigger at some levels. It may be a, a sliver that you can see that runs the entire length of the spinal cord. But that, that finding on an MRI scan is not a reason to recommend surgery. Having a syrinx that's usually three millimeters diameter is, is the threshold that's given. So if it's more than three millimeters, and certainly if it's associated with symptoms or scoliosis or something like that, then that's a justification for a surgical recommendation and, and you're likely to see the patient have some benefit from that. Uh, so what do we actually do when we do Chiari surgery? The goal is basically to make more room so that we're relieving neural compression and we're creating a situation so the spinal fluid can circulate more freely back and forth between the spinal canal and the intracranial subarachnoid space. There are basically three steps. Uh, obviously there's a skin incision, there's muscle dissection. You have to dissect your way down to the base of the skull just above the foramen magnum and then across the foramen magnum to the back of the first cervical vertebrae, the first neck bone back here, and usually the soft tissue dissection is carried down to the top of the second cervical vertebrae just so you have enough room to work. Uh, and then we remove bone from the, occiput the occipital region and make the foramen magnum larger. And in 
an adult or an adult-sized adolescent patient, uh, we typically want to have a, a, an, an opening here where we remove bone about two centimeters wide, that's a little less than an inch, and two centimeters up from where the frame and magnum is when we start. And then we also take a segment out of the first cervical vertebrae, which is two, and two, two to two and a half centimeters wide. Uh, I should pause here and say that there are about as many ways to do Chiari decompression surgery as there are surgeons that do Chiari decompression surgery. Everybody has their own way of doing things. There are minor variations from one surgeon to the next, one center to the next, et cetera. But one of the big controversies is then once you've removed the bone uh, and maybe um, cut some of the little ligamentous bands that are on the back of the dura, that sac that's covering the spinal fluid space, um, is it okay to stop there or do you need to open the dura and look inside? And if people have specific questions about that, we could talk about it a little bit later, but let me just <laughs> leave it at that, that they're, they're kind of two surgical camps uh, and there are surgeons who will always open the dura, there, will surgeons, there are surgeons who rarely open the dura, and there are surgeons who open the dura in certain circumstances and not others. Uh, in my training, uh, I've pretty much always opened the dura, and one of the reasons for that is it, there is a subset of Chiari patients who have something inside the dura, inside the spinal fluid pathways, that's not letting the spinal fluid circulate freely like it should. Uh, and the, the term that's most often used for that is a, an arachnoid veil, and it's most commonly found at the outlet of the fourth ventricle. So if you don't open the dura and look for it, you won't find it. Uh, th the reason that a lot of surgeons don't always open the dura, and some almost never open the dura, is because if you don't open the dura, it's a quicker operation. Patients usually get out of the hospital sooner, uh, and there's a lower potential for complications related to opening the dura. Uh, but if you don't open the dura and the patient doesn't benefit from the bony decompression surgery, or bone only as it's often referred to, then you're going to have to operate on them again because you haven't solved their problem. So that's why it's a controversy. Uh, so with rare exceptions, I will open the dura, look inside for any sort of veil, uh, and then you have to close the dura, but you want to close the dura in such a way that the spinal fluid is going to be able to circulate better. So to do that, uh, you need to sew in something in the defect that you've just created in the dura. And you can think of it as kind of like letting the waist out on a pair of pants. You've got to have some additional material, cloth, something, to, to sew into that gap that you've just created. This is another area where there's a lot of variation from one surgeon to the next. Um, the, the way that I was trained, and I, I think it makes a lot of sense, is to use the patient's own tissue whenever possible. Uh, and there's a tissue layer right outside the skull, which serves very well as a patch. Uh, the only downside of doing that is to get a good piece of that, you typically have to make another small incision higher up on the back of the head to harvest it, and then close that, and then you could use that to sew in the patch. You got to sew the patch in in such a way that it's going to hold water, spinal fluid. Spinal fluid is basically water with some, some electrolytes in it. Uh, so in order to be able to show you this full screen, I'm going to duck out of here. So this is a very well edited two minute clip of a Chiari decompression surgery done here a few years ago. This is actually one of Dr. Oakes's cases. Uh, so the bone has already been removed and he's starting to open the dura. So just for orientation, this end of the screen, the patient's feet are this way, the top of the head is this way. So the opening of the dura was started about where that cervical vertebrae number one, that ring of bone was removed and then the opening progresses from bottom up and then as you get to about the level of where the foramen magnum was, because bone's been removed, remember, uh, then we usually split the incision so you can think of the, the cut as being like a capital letter Y with the, the bottom of it down here and the two top limbs up here. So these are little clips being put on the, 
the edges of the dura to hold the arachnoid up. So here is looking inside. This is the patient's right cerebellar tonsil, left cerebellar tonsil, and we've just got a tiny view into the outlet of the fourth ventricle. And you see there's a little filmy membrane that's being spread apart. And we want to have enough of a, a look in here between the two tonsils to see into the fourth ventricle and see a little bit of what's called the choroid plexus, which is the tissue in the ventricles of the brain that's actually making the spinal fluid. So if you see that, you know you're, you're, you're into the space that you want to get into and have, have established a, a corridor for the spinal fluid to get out of the fourth ventricle. Okay, so it started over. <coughs> All right, so when patients come in for this surgery, they typically come in the day of surgery to the, the one day admission area. They go to the operating room, of course, under general anesthesia. Surgery takes a couple hours. Uh, we routinely watch them in the intensive care unit overnight. Uh, next day, pretty much everybody goes to a regular room and then it's a matter of another two or three days to where they're walking, going to the bathroom normally, eating regular food, and their pain control is adequate with something that they can take by mouth, not something that's going in the IV. Uh, children usually will be able to go back to school a week or so after they've left the hospital. Uh, and two to three months after surgery, they can return to unrestricted activity, except that patients who have Chiari malformations, whether they've had surgery or not, uh, I advise them not to participate in what I call collision sports. The most popular one in these parts being football. Uh, other examples, hockey, boxing, wrestling, things where you're trying to knock the other person down and they're trying to knock you down. Okay. Uh, so for patients who have had surgery, we typically want to see them back in our clinic of two or three weeks after surgery, make sure things look like they're healing okay. And then a few months after that, uh, we'll have them back for another checkup. If it's somebody for whom syrinx was the reason that we recommended surgery or maybe other symptoms as well, but if, if they had a significant syrinx, then uh, usually we want to wait at least four, maybe up to six months before we get another MRI because it can take a significant amount of time to see a noticeable difference on the scan, uh, particularly if it's a really big one like the one I showed earlier. Uh, this patient had some other symptoms as well, but here's a before and after. So you see they have this fairly focal, not huge syrinx like the one I showed earlier uh, in the, the mid portion of the, their cervical spinal cord. And you can see the configuration of their tonsils here is rather pointed and there's not a lot of space for spinal fluid to circulate. So here they are sometime after surgery, probably four to six months. Uh, the tips of the tonsils are more rounded now. There's more black in here, more room for the spinal fluid to circulate. And the syrinx was that and now it's just a sliver that you can barely see. Uh, patients on whom I've, I've done a Chiari decompression, I typically want to follow them uh, annually until they're done growing or uh, for those who are, are doing well, uh, I won't necessarily have them follow up with an adult neurosurgeon after they graduate from children's. Uh, certainly if they've had to have surgery more than once or have had any other sorts of problems, uh, then I'll facilitate uh, getting them referred to one of our adult colleagues. So that leaves a whole bunch of patients that have Chiari's that have been found either incidentally or because of symptoms that we don't think are referable to the Chiari malformation that we don't do surgery on. So what do we do for those? Well, we do several things for them. Uh, if they have a, a, a Chiari that's a real Chiari, uh, because about a third of the patients who are referred to us because of a report of a Chiari on a scan, don't actually meet the radiographic criteria and they either don't have symptoms or they have symptoms that are not referable to the Chiari malformation. Uh, 
But for those uh, who have something that we think is significant, and, and even if they don't have symptoms, bears uh, worth uh, watching them, uh, we'll follow those either in our individual clinics or uh, in the multidisciplinary Chiari clinic. Uh, and what I've typically done for those over the years uh, is see them on an annual basis for several years, uh, get a follow-up scan two years after their initial diagnosis, and another one two years beyond that, uh, mainly looking to see if there's any change in their Chiari. Once in a while you'll see something that looks relatively innocent like this and over time progresses to look worse and maybe they develop symptoms associated with that. Uh, and in a handful of patients over the years, you'll see either no syrinx and then they have a syrinx later, uh, or they might have that mild dilation of the central canal, the little sliver that then gets bigger uh, over time. Uh, if they have no symptoms and no appreciable change or uh, even more commonly than looking worse in terms of the, the tonsillar herniation that uh, may actually regress over time, uh, then after the second scan, if they're doing well, their scan is stable or improved, then I'll tell them they don't need to come back unless something changes. Uh, this is a good time to mention the Chiari Clinic in a little more detail. So about five years ago, Dr. Oaks set up a Chiari Clinic in conjunction with our Chief of Child Neurology because we had a large number of children who were coming in with either a radiographic diagnosis of Chiari or a mild Chiari and symptoms that we would not attribute to the Chiari malformation. Uh, and he would tell them, good news, you don't need surgery. And then the patients would leave and, and call back in relatively short order saying, but I still have headache, com most commonly, or some other symptom. Uh, so the focus of the Chiari Clinic is to provide help for those patients from more than just a surgical direction. Uh, and Amy Finch in the back of the room uh, is a, an excellent uh, discerner of who belongs in which clinic. Uh, because she decides based on the reported symptoms um, and to some extent the imaging report whether this is somebody who needs to be seen soon because they've got a problem that is likely to be helped with surgery and those who are less likely to be helped by surgery but need to see have a more holistic approach to whatever their complaints are. Uh, and she has a very high success rate in determining who belongs in which clinic. All right, so that's all I got. <laughs> Go ahead. So that's what this is for. <laughs> so in your Chiari clinic and um, <coughs> when you're assessing the people and all, what actual physicians are available there to help and um, so is it just headache doctors, is it pain doctors, is it <coughs> who is in that clinic? Well we don't have a pediatric pain doctor or service. Uh, we did at one point and that person left. Uh, so it's myself and, and Dr. Dewar who is our chief of child neurology and so he's mainly focused on headache but he certainly uh, is well equipped to, to handle other pain complaints uh, and he is also much more adept than I am uh, in evaluating the not just the patient but the patient family psychosocial situation for stressors and other things that may be contributing to their complaints that I can't fix with surgery. So I, I just want to thank you really, really so much for taking the time tonight to do this. And um, this video will be going up on uh, the CSF Info website. So if you want to revisit it and look at it, um, it'll be there. Also, please let everybody know that you couldn't come tonight in your groups, that it will be available. And then our hope is that we can do this at least uh, once or twice to try and develop a support group down here for people. But that's going to take you guys to reaching out to the people you know and say, hey, we got to come down, we have to do this um, together and hear another great lecture. So um, please do that. Please sign up at the registry and please thank Dr. Vassell for tonight. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.